Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming to the GQFI Wasso Screen Theory Seminar. We are very happy today to have uh, Victor Gobiento to talk about his work with uh, Imin Chen and Juan Mancena on the bracket wormholes and cosmological states. So, Victor, please take it away. Yeah, uh, thank you. So indeed, I'm going to talk about um, largely about this uh, paper that we wrote with uh, Juan and Ming uh, earlier this year. And uh, um, yeah, I will try to introduce this uh, concept of uh, bracket wormholes. Um, and uh, in particular, I will start with some uh, bigger motivation for why we started thinking about um, all these issues, and in particular, uh, the, the motivation comes in the context of uh, cosmology. Um, but and then, well, you'll see that motivation is uh, is maybe a little bit vague. Okay, it's, it will not be something too concrete and uh, promise to work. Uh, and then instead, we will switch to a um, some uh, toy model problem, okay. In particular, it will be this uh, the second uh, um, bullet point Euclidean ADS setup, and this is the setup where uh, we can really do concrete calculations and sort of things do work out in the way that we expect. Uh, but you will see it's not quite what it will be not quite what we want to do in the motivation, okay. And then in the third part of the talk, I will try to get closer to the original cosmological problem. And well, you will see that there things uh, uh, do not maybe work as smoothly, but I guess the point is that we did not yet, uh, um, the problem seems a bit complicated, so we didn't sort of solve the full problem. So uh, that, will, that will be roughly gradually transition to work in progress. And uh, yeah, I, I think I usually give talks that are, uh, hmm? Somebody is not hearing me. No. Uh, actually, I can hear you very clearly. So I guess probably there shouldn't be a problem with. Uh, okay. Your Somebody order. sent in the chat that there is no audio. But if, if go ahead. Or I'll try to speak with them and try to solve it. Okay. Okay. Anyway, yeah, I, I continue. But yeah, feel free to interrupt me. As I say, as I try to start to say, it's relatively informal. So. Feel free to interrupt me, especially if there are some technical problems. Just, uh, just tell me. I'll send in chat. Okay. So uh, the, the the first question I want to ask is that why why do we think that some non perturbative gravitational effects uh, can be important in cosmology? And by this, I, I say that really in real world cosmology. Okay, it's not not just in some abstract formal thinking about eternal inflation, but maybe in the real world cosmology, uh, some sort of unusual non perturbative gravitational effects can be important. Okay, so this is this is basically a bold, well, not claim, but let's say the bold hope. And so some analogy comes from uh, uh, black holes. Okay, so it's, it's quite common to um, compare some cosmological space times, especially the Cedar space, uh, with uh, black hole space times. So let me just review it uh, very briefly at the level of uh, words. So bla in black holes, of course, very importantly, we have black hole horizon. That, okay, this is like a Penrose diagram of a black hole in, in flat space. And then we have a black hole horizon over here. And we also have cosmological horizons in the Cedar space. So here I remind you that this is this uh, the full square. It is a Penrose diagram of a global um, the Cedar space. And if we consider some observer, some time like observer that lives in this the Cedar space, he sees um, uh, what's called the cosmological horizon. Okay. So now, it, it, importantly for black hole physics is that there is a Hawking radiation. Okay. It's some uh, quantum mechanical effect that there is some radiation comes out of the horizon in some sense so that the black hole uh, eventually evaporates. Now in the Cedar space, the some analog of this uh, Hawking radiation is the what we call primordial fluctuations. Okay. So there's some um, uh, primordial fluctuations that are um, Cre created in some way by non-zero curvature of uh, uh, the Cedar space. Uh, and then uh, this fluctuation, they comprise some, you know, CMB power spectrum that they get enhanced. Uh, they 
by gravitational effects, they classicalize and then uh, they produce galaxies and uh, uh, stars and you know everything that we see around us. So the advantage of the citrus space versus black holes is that uh, if Hawking radiation is probably something that we will never uh, ever measure, then this uh, uh, analog of Hawking radiation in the citrus space is something that we really measure and observe and more of everything. All the structure we see around us it actually consists uh, out of um, uh, initially from this radiation. Okay, um, and then uh, the uh, two leading order in some leading semi classical approximation, um, uh, the Hawking radiation is just a thermal power spectrum. And all analog of this statement in the theater is that the uh, primordial fluctuations they form just a scale invariant Gaussian power spectrum. So it's not really fair to say that this primordial uh, uh, radiation is uh, thermal, but it's some very simple, uh, very simple state. Okay, and what we learned in the context of uh, black hole physics, I mean, we sort of uh, knew it a while ago, but it became more sharp, uh, as I will review in a moment, is that because of finiteness of black hole entropy, uh, there are actually some uh, uh, large, uh, and interesting corrections uh, to uh, thermality of uh, Hawking radiation uh, that that become important at late times. Okay, time scales set by this uh, uh, black hole entropy, and what 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 became known, uh, what what we just understood recently is that uh, there are some non-perturbative effects that dominates the naive calculation at least to a thermality. And moreover, um, for some observables, so properly chosen observables, uh, these non-perturbative effects, they're under uh, computational control, okay? At least, at least in some uh, simplified mode. So uh, there is a, in the Cedar space, uh, there is some sort of analog of uh, uh, black hole entropy, which is the gibbons Hawking entropy. Again, it's just a horizon area. Um, of uh, just for the point here on the horizon, it's some two sphere and its area in Planck units. Uh, it, what, that's what's called uh, Gibbons Hawking entropy. Its interpretation is not so clear. Okay, I, I don't think that, that it, it, I think it's fair to say that nobody really has a you know a robust interpretation of, of this entropy. Uh, but we could conjecture, okay, that oh, that something similar happens uh, in cosmology. That this primordial fluctuation they're only approximately described by the usual semi-classical uh, picture, okay, that leads to this uh, Gaussian uh, scalar power spectrum. But for, at least for some long enough inflationary periods, and this was carefully chosen observables, some non-perturbative effects uh, become important. Um, the problem here is that uh, unlike, unlike in the black hole case, we don't have any examples where we have some UV complete microscopical uh, description of cosmology. So maybe the main motivation here is to uh, start from the opposite end, start from some uh, gravitational calculations that, that we can you know, try to do. And, and if we see some interesting, unusual effect, maybe it will point us, uh, give us some hint on how to, uh, how to come up with this microscopic uh, theory for cosmology. Okay, so this is the big motivation. Let me uh, very briefly uh, mention that there are some complementary different views uh, of of the sitter space. So I drew here, like I don't want to go into it in too many details unless people want because it will it will take lots of time. But there is there is one way. So, so what I drew here, okay, the square it's always a global uh, the sitter space, okay. And um, yeah, in global the sitter space, uh, I can think about some inflationary observer. Okay, so there is an inflationary observer that that leaves somewhere near the boundary and it can, you can have like a Poincaré slice like this or maybe it's just a global time slice like this and at late times uh, they are not very different and this is how I'm going to uh, look at uh, the sitter space I would really focus on this sort of expanding part morally okay and moreover I will look at it at late times so this is a uh, uh, maybe better. I mean, it's all picture of global series. I'll, I'll, I'll write here that it is an uh, inflationary viewpoint. Okay, that's just to to sort of guide you what sorts of observables I have in mind. 
Uh, there are other ways to look at the sitter space. For example, we can look at this um, uh, static patch observer. This is when we focus on a world line of some guy who lives here, okay? And he really observes only this uh, much smaller static patch of the sitter space. And Pedro's diagrams, they look comparable, but really this slice of it here has uh, infinite uh, spatial volume, right? And Whatever this guy sees, it's always just one uh, Hubble volume worth of space time. Okay, although there are some viewpoints that this should be complementary. There are other ways to look at the sitter space. There's something that's going to play a role if, if I get there is a hyperbolic slicing of the sitter space, which is slicing like this. And again, this hyperbolic observer. At late times, he's very similar to this inflationary observer, although his patch consists of sort of two similarly disconnected regions. Um, this region of space time over here, this is called uh, DS, DS patch. Okay, this is something that Eva Silverstein. Uh, has uh, uh, work and, and still uh, working on a lot, and and uh, and, and, and in, the reason this patch is called the DSDS patch is that uh, if we consider a, uh, this uh, fixed spatial slice, you know, a slice like this, that this is a d minus one dimensional the uh, sitter space, and there is some version of holography or Randall syndrome that that is supposed to. Uh, describe this patch. Okay, there is something else that's important in the sitter space, um, uh, which is the DS uh, Schwarzschild space time. But okay, I probably won't talk about it now, uh, although it, it also plays some role in our discussion. And then uh, there is another viewpoint uh, of the sitter space is that some, you know, uh, sometimes people say this for like Sandus Taker. Whatever is that to uh, in, in the context of some eternal inflating the sitter space, this inflationary observer it becomes meaningless. Okay, so when I talk about an inflationary observer, I sort of assume that uh, that the heat the sitter space ends and there is some heating that that then there is some guy that you know can that sits over here can see uh, all this uh, reheating surface. But sometimes people say that 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 just is not true that that does not exist. And we really need to focus on this uh, observer that uh, uh, a smaller patch. Okay, so, so this 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 guy over here, it's like analog of this observer with the difference that he doesn't see uh, the entire the sitter space. Okay, he has some time slicing that goes like this, and then the rest is some very complicated. So these things, there's some nucleating bubbles, blah blah blah, some very complicated. Uh, future infinity that is not clear how to interpret and all you should talk is to define observables living in this patch. Okay, I just wanted to, to spell out that, that there are this may, many different um, uh, viewpoints on the sitter space and eventually in some big picture the hope is that they will all unify. Uh, but I will focus on this and all I wanted to say that if, if for some reason you're a strong um, uh, believer in, in this picture, I don't think that there is a much, too much of a difference between this observer uh, and this observer, at least for what I'm going to say. Uh, okay, so, so that, this is, this is um, uh, some sort of motivational and introductional uh, part. Uh, are there any questions for this? Okay. Then um, let me move uh, to the second part. So as you, as you probably sensed, so this thing above was a little bit vague. So we want to try to consider some uh, toy models, okay, for cosmology where we could uh, uh, try to put some uh, meat on this uh, statement, namely the statement, the, the conjecture that I outlined that uh, um, finiteness of the theater entropy leads to an importance of some non-perturbative gravitational effect. Okay, so for this, uh, let's first review uh, briefly uh, a model of uh, black hole evaporation. Okay, that uh, something called the East Coast model, uh, at least in some 
uh, jargon, okay? So uh, this is a model of uh, two-dimensional de Sitter gravity. Sorry, two-dimensional anti de Sitter gravity. So here I have uh, negative curvature. So this is uh, so-called Jaikif tidal boim gravity in ADS. And for my purposes, I will need this model in uh, in Euclidean ADS spacetime. Okay, uh, plus some matter. Uh, so this is the uh, action of pure Jakiv tidal boim gravity. Okay, uh, as uh, you probably know, the Einstein-Hilbert term uh, in two dimensions is just a total derivative. So that's why to get something um, dynamical, uh, we introduce a dilaton. Okay, that, uh, that that sits in front of the Einstein-Hilbert term, but then uh, this dilaton sets the curvature exactly to be constant. So gravitational dynamics here is really simple. And then we have a matter sector, uh, which we we will take for some simplification uh, a large C CFT. Okay, so this is some effective field theory. Unlike pure JT gravity, this model is not UV complete, so this needs to be some UV completion, but it's not going to play a role. Okay, then in this model we consider the following setup. Uh, we we say first we, there is a solution of this model, which is uh, symmetric takes uh, uh, this form and the dilaton uh, takes this form. This is just a Poincaré slicing of uh, Euclidean ADS spacetime. And it's denoted by this uh, green region, okay? And then we're going to say that at some uh, fi finite by large value of the dilaton when phi is equal to some large value phi b, okay? And this, which corresponds to z being uh, equal to some cutoff, small but finite cutoff value epsilon, we transition, uh, we're going to transition to flat space, okay? And in this flat space, we turn off gravity. So this is these models that um, uh, maybe some people are familiar with. I mean, they were they were largely discussed recently. So uh, the purpose of this uh, flat space region is to have some bath into which uh, radiation can escape. As you see, as drawn here, the CFT fields uh, they just go smoothly uh, through this boundary. So in particular, if there is some black hole in this space time, uh, it can evaporate completely. Okay. Unlike you know black holes, large black holes in, in ADS, they normally cannot evaporate. But here they can evaporate because uh, radiation can escape uh, through infinity. Okay, good. And yeah, just want to stress this. So here I'm, I, I have um, uh, Euclidean uh, um, uh, Euclidean time, and this coordinate uh, chi for me is like Euclidean time. So if I try to have some quantum mechanical interpretation of this picture, I'm going to cut it like this. And I call, I call, you know, whatever is below is like a breath of my wave function, whatever above is a cat. And then here I can, you know, do some weak rotation and uh, uh, do Lorentzian evolution uh, starting from that slice. Okay, and here in this model, so this is some, uh, you know, version of ADS CFT applies to it. So we can excise uh, this whole gravitational region and replace it with this, what is this thick uh, uh, green line. Uh, it is now some uh, holographic CFT, some version of say SYK model, for example, that replaces uh, effectively this uh, gravitational region uh, in terms of ADS CFT correspondence. Okay. Good. So there is a lot to be said about this model, uh, but um, uh, about, uh, yeah, to those who are familiar with this, I, I just wanted to make a connection. Otherwise, our discussion will be uh, sort of independent. What we want to do, we want to look at this picture at the uh, 90 degrees. Uh, so what I'm going to do is to use technology here. Okay. And, oops, just rotate this picture. Uh, by 90 degrees. Because it was all Euclidean, it's sort of easy to do. But now I really want to think of what we usually think as a radial coordinate uh, in ADS as, as my uh, Euclidean time. Okay, and now I have I still have the same metric. So I still have this uh, Euclidean ADS space here and then it transitions into flat space. But now it starts to look at least at the level of some Penrose diagram, it starts to look, uh, although okay, it's Euclidean, but 
whatever, the level of this Euclidean diagram, it starts to look uh, like cosmology, okay? I have some gravitational space-time with some curvature, and then it sort of reheats uh, at this point and transitions into, well, flat space, okay? Some, in the real world, we transition some of our W. Here, we just transition some flat space, but radiation uh, produced by this gravitational region, it escapes into flat space, okay? And then we can... Uh, we draw this uh, this red line uh, where we uh, do some measurement related to our state okay and so we're going to call this state uh, created on this uh, red line as uh, b of tau okay uh, and this is so this is our main goal is to study properties of this uh, state uh, uh, b of tau and the idea is that this state it has a contribution uh, of um, this uh, semi-classical leading semi-classical saddle that corresponds to uh, to this uh, space time to uh, to solution with this metric and this uh, sorry yeah, the, the, this is the flat space metric over here and uh, uh, this value uh, of the dilaton but there are some corrections to it okay and it turns out that these corrections uh, are uh, extremely important uh, so, uh, mm -hmm. just for clarification, V of tau is a state at the end of the flat space boundary? Yeah, well, this is, uh, so this say, um, yeah, it's defined that any tau is the time that uh, uh, exhausts from this point uh, into the uh, flat space region, okay? So it yeah it can be any it can be any time. Moreover, we can choose to uh, at some point you know go to Lorentzian, right? This is just flat space. We can say that this uh, uh, tau is some um, you know tau one plus uh, i tau two, and then study uh, Lorentzian evolution of the state. Okay. So I just want to know where this state is prepared. It's prepared at the end of the flat space boundary. So well, it's yeah, it's 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 prepared by combination, if you like, of this gravitational evolution in Euclidean ideas and some evolution in flat space, which is just evolution with the uh, the CFT Hamiltonian, right? Because I turned off gravity completely. So it's prepared by a combination uh, of these two evolutions. And uh, we are claiming that uh, the leading order meaning the, the leading order contribution of this state is semi-classical. This is what's going to be a little bit subtle. Uh, so this is, that's what I said that this, uh, e, e, well, I'd say it's always, it's, we claim that it's always semi-classical because, uh, uh, you know, the semi-classical approximation uh, seems to be uh, under control, but uh, the question is which saddles contribute. Yeah. And uh, we, we will see that, that, that's going to become a little bit subtle, okay? But naive, let's say naively, we would think uh, that this uh, that the diagram, the drawn here, gives the leading contribution, right? That's what we sort of usually. I mean, here when we draw this picture, we say that the leading contribution is given by just some uh, simple, you know, topology drawn here, right? There are some uh, there are some corrections. We can attach some handles. To this space time, for example, right? Because there is dynamical gravity, and now the viewpoint is that in Euclidean gravity, at least you need to attach some handles, but they are suppressed by something, right? Uh, suppressed yeah. by this factor of S0 uh, that is small. So S0 is large, so they're suppressed by e to the minus. So this guy is suppressed by e to the minus S0. So by the same reasoning, we would we would assume that there is some leading contribution that comes from this uh, uh, simple. Uh, leading or uh, approximation, but then there are some corrections uh, over here, but they are suppressed by e to the minus s zero. Okay, so this is the sort of the the, the naive picture. And uh, this state, since this state is dynamical, as we see that replica wormholes turn out to be dominant after the page time, we'll find that uh, non semi classical part, uh, non semi classical contribution to this state has a significant uh, part in the preparation of the this state yeah and this is what we will find indeed this is what we will find but we will see that it's not the replica wormholes that play the main role we will find something similar okay 
Uh, thank you, sir. Other questions? Good, yeah, so uh, just one next step is that um, uh, having a state interpretation uh, of this picture, it makes it natural to calculate uh, objects like this. It makes it natural to calculate expectation values of uh, operators uh, inserted at this uh, uh, red surface, okay? Or in the simplest case, uh, it makes it natural to calculate expectation value of the um, identity operator with just the norm of this state, okay? So to do this, we just take these two pictures. So you see, this is my uh, this is my uh, state that I'm preparing here. Okay, I fill it here, uh, and then I put a uh, a cat of this state that now times goes in the uh, opposite direction, and I trace it over here. Okay, so uh, now for this observable, uh, the claim is that this is only one of the semi-classical contributions. Uh, there is another contribution with a different topology. You see the point is that here the space time here is dynamical. So I sort of should allow the, the rules of Euclidean uh, quantum gravity that we're using is that we only specify the boundaries. We only specify this non-gravitational region, but in the gravitational region uh, we can do whatever we want. In particular we can consider at least uh, a geometry like this. Okay, so this is my non-gravitational region. This is my surface where I glue Brian cat and insert the operators. And this space time now has topology of a, a cylinder. Okay. Good. So this is what is called the bracket wormhole. Let's make it red. So the claim is that this is some object of uh, central importance, and at least in this model. It is indeed an object of uh, uh, central importance. So let's understand it uh, a little bit better. So first of all, what is the classical solution? Classical solution is that metric here uh, in this region is given by uh, you know another parameterization, still courage, still um, a constant curvature metric, uh, just with a different scale factor. And you see this coordinate sigma. It now uh, it has a finite range. It goes from epsilon to pi minus epsilon. And again, this epsilon is determined by uh, you know largeness of the value of the inflaton. We still have large and fixed values sorry, of diloton, which is sort of similar to inflaton in this model, uh, phi is equal to phi b. But what's important, the profile uh, for the diloton uh, is very different uh, than it was uh, on the initial solution. In particular, it takes this form, and and this again, this this calculation is very similar to the uh, Maldacena key traversable wormhole. Um, the point is that to have this solution, uh, there is something like um, uh, you know, I think sometimes it's called holographic A theorem or something that if you don't have sources of uh, uh, knowledge recondition, if you don't have sources that violate knowledge recondition, you cannot really have this situation where your scale factor, you know, goes into the bulk and then bounces back uh, and uh, becomes something large. But here, because we're putting our theory on a circle, because we, uh, we're tracing the, the matter fields are just being traced over here, right? Because I'm, uh, I'm just computing the trace um, in this case. We get a negative Casimir energy on this circle. Okay. Well, it's more like free energy, uh, but uh, but but anyway, um, uh, there is a negative contribution to energy due to fur due to our CFT fields having loops around the circle. So that back reacts on the uh, diloton a lot and allows us to have this solution. Okay. Good. Uh, let's compare contributions of these two solutions, the the naive semi-classical saddle and a bracket one pole. Sorry, Victor, just yes. one question. The C is the central charge of the matter? Yes. Okay, okay. Yeah, and C is and always the, central charge of the matter. Yeah, and then this you take very large. Yes, yes. We can, we can discuss in a bit how we scale it. Okay, maybe I, I say it now. We take, uh, uh, so there is this parameter S0, right? Uh, so we take a zero over C uh, large, but sort of finite. And we take both a zero 
and c to infinity okay so that's the scaling if you like so s0 is the largest number c is of order s0 and s0 over c is like largest but largish but fine so that's that's the most convenient scaling we can discuss why we do it so just uh, one more clarification sir uh, the semi classical state is proposed is prepared using the hawking hartle uh, path integral formulation or yes. is it okay. yes yes this this state is uh, what's fair to call a no boundary state okay in uh, in the o hartle hawking hartle hawking and no boundary that's a synonym for me uh, Yes, let's let's. So this state is not really what Cartel and Hawking would tell us to do. Okay. Um, however, it is a legitimate semi-classical contribution, and I think at least in this model, we are pretty confident we will see that it's necessary to consider this state. So that's that's the main point. The main question here is, uh, what are the situations where this bracket? wormholes are important in general. That's not yet understood, but in this model we understand. Okay, so that's what I'm trying to explain. So, but let's do some, uh, proceed a little bit with the calculation. So, so this state, indeed, is a hartle hawking state. So it has the, its contribution, its norm is e to the 2s0, right? That's the usually, uh, usual horizon area. Uh, that's the norm of the, you know, usually we get like, uh, uh, in the Sitter space, say we get e to the, uh, and Planck squared uh, over H squared, right? So this is what replaces uh, uh, this thing in higher dimensions. But now hartle hawking state always gets enhanced by the sphere contribution to gravitational path integral because e to the two is zero. However, bracket wormholes, they do not, the gravitational action doesn't get this large factor here. However, the matter action uh, gets enhanced because there is this uh, free energy, okay? Uh, and the matter action turns out on the solution to be equal to this value, e to the c squared L of a phi B, where L is the transfer size of my special direction. And the analog here of going to late page time, remember I switched time and space. So analog of going to late time is to go into large universes. So if I take my universe to be large enough, then this factor will always dominate uh, over this factor, okay? So we find that trace of the density matrix is dominated by this uh, non-trivial uh, topological contribution, okay? And moreover, all expectation values of simple operators are also dominated by this connected geometry. So this is something I want to, I want to emphasize. So if in the black hole case, we had to come up with some relatively complicated observables, say, you know, entropy or rainy entropy, those are complicated observables, um, complicated to measure, let's say, uh, to, to, to see some, uh, some of these non-perturbative effects. Well, here it's really the simplest observables you can imagine, just expectation values of, you know, local simple operators seem to be dominated uh, by this uh, bracket wormhole as long as the universe is large enough, okay? Yeah, Victor, I have a question. Sure. So in the second picture in bracket wormhole that you glue the two green region of the first picture together, uh, and then you have an extra scale, which is this length of the universe you call L, but how come that in the first in the classical case, there is no such length scale. Oh, no, no, it, it is also, I was sort of taking it infinite because this uh, uh, this object does not depend on the uh, length of the universe, right? Because it's, what is this length of the universe? Um, it's, so, okay, let me let me draw the, the Sitter analog. Maybe it's a little bit simpler, right? So the Sitter analog, this is really some analytic continuation. So, so we start from a sphere, the heart of Hawking state, and then it expands, right? So this is the global decider space, you agree? Mm -hmm. So this length is just the length uh, of say, uh, of, you know, of special, of special size of the universe now when we measure it, right? So it's very, very large, but the hartle hawking state doesn't get enhancement proportional to this L, right? Because when we calculate the norm, it's only the, uh, the sphere that matters for hartle hawking This whole Lorentz and uh, evolution cancels. So something, so so it's something similar happens here. Okay, so this is all Euclidean, 
but uh, there is an analog uh, of uh, this situation uh, that um, the leading the leading saddle doesn't care about the spatial size of the universe okay uh, while this bracket wormhole it is subleading in gravitational counting uh, but it gets enhancement that's proportional to the total size of the universe okay that's why it wins it's it's the same of, it's morally similar effect how the when you compute this entropy in the replica wormholes you know the hawking's uh, calculation does not get this enhancement of late times i mean that's what entropy grows with time while the replica wormholes they dominate at late times so it's it's similar 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 thing happens here but you know technically different because we have different apologies right uh, but uh, right right but it's the same kind of uh, feel here that you get some large um, extent this time in space not in time and then you look for some effects that grow that add up coherently uh, with this extensive dimension and this bracket wormhole is such an effect okay i see thanks So now let's let's study a little bit better the state. So we get we get something that doesn't look like a pure state anymore, right? We get some uh, uh, contribution uh, to the density matrix that doesn't look like a product of uh, two wave functions. So we get uh, naively matter fields. They see that they live in a thermal state, right? Because uh, they live on this uh, Euclidean time as compact. So we could think that it's a thermal state. Uh, good. So uh, naive, naive entropy. If we do, let's do, let's do calculation. Okay, it's a little bit uh, more instructive to pick some finite region of the length little l. Okay, in our uh, uh, yellow non-gravitational region and calculate its entropy. So naive entropy is just a thermal entropy of a CFT. Okay, uh, given uh, given by this factor, and it's again scales extensively with the uh, with the length of the interval. Good. However, in the presence of gravity, uh, this is not uh, the uh, right way to uh, calculate entropy, right? Instead, we should use this, uh, the island formula. Let me review the island formula very quickly uh, because you know, I, I hope that people know uh, some of it. So again, if I have my um, uh, space time where I have gravitational space time here, and I have the non-gravitational space time here. So now I switched back to the, you know, the ADS. So now sort of time, uh, time goes this way uh, because I just want to uh, review. So if we want to calculate entropy of uh, say some region over here, okay, uh, we need to use uh, some uh, Ruta Kanagi formula, but now there is this extension of Ruta Kanagi formula which tells us that we are allowed to uh, nucleate uh, sort of uh, twist twist fields, right? So twist fields uh, is, um, uh, so these guys are twist fields, right? When we calculate entropy, we uh, can uh, nucleate some, sorry, we insert some in two dimensions, we insert some twist fields and calculate their expectation values. So this island formula tells us that we can also have dynamical twist fields in our disposal that we can nucleate in the uh, gravitational space time and every time we nucleate this field we pay a power of uh, s0 in this case horizon area uh, but what we should minimize so so we should so the the island formula it says that we should s is the minimum over uh, over positions of twist fields. And also the number of twist fields in a sense, right? Of what's called uh, generalized entropy. And generalized entropy, uh, this is like uh, sum of, uh, uh, sorry, I shouldn't be saying S0 here. It is uh, S0 plus phi. This is the total value of the dilaton that uh, that sets uh, the area right uh, in in this two dimensional model. So you should think of the dilaton as some radius of a two sphere in four dimensions. So the horizon area is the value of the dilaton. 
So generalized entropy is the sum over this uh, S0, sum over, over, I, over positions of twist fields. Okay, uh, plus the uh, matter entropy, but matter entropy is now taken on this uh, entire region. Okay, that uh, that extends from the original twist fields uh, to the dynamical twist fields, and this region over here. Well, maybe I should draw something. Uh, say I generated two twist fields, and then my generalized entropy is a union of this region and this region. And uh, this is what's called an island. Okay. Uh, okay. I, if it's necessary, I can review it in more details. Uh, but uh, this was basically the result of some developments of, of, of the last few years of this uh, entropy studies. But anyway, let's just say we believe in this formula. So this is some rule that we should also use uh, uh, in this case. So now if we have, so I'm going to look for islands on this geometry, okay? So these are my original twist fields over here, right? But now I'm allowed in principle to generate, you know, twist fields anywhere uh, here in the dynamical gravitational region. So after some manipulations, it turns out it's sort of easy to convince yourselves that the most optimal way is to generate twist fields on the opposite side of the cylinder, okay? So that's what's drawn here. I mean, I just cut my cylinder uh, in half to be able to draw and the answer the answer of this of this minimization procedure uh, is that uh, there is an island on the sort of parallel to my original island but on the opposite side of the cylinder okay I, I hope this picture is clear if, if it's not clear this is picture is that suppresses the uh, spatial direction so it's just a time circle so this is my original non-gravitational interval that's my original twist field and then I have a uh, island on the other side, okay? So now you see the point is that uh, my matter here is in a thermal field double state with the matter on the opposite side of the cylinder, right? Because I can think of it as just a Euclidean preparation of a thermal field double state. So all this thermal entropy uh, gets neutralized by considering the union of this interval and the island. So what we get is, again, after some manipulation, we get just two S0 uh, because of this topology, because we inserted two of the twist fields, right? It's just this factor. And then we get some extra factor of C over four. So you see that this object is IR safe in a sense that it does not grow anymore when uh, L goes to infinity. So it dominates for L bigger than this number, dominates over the the naive answer, okay? The thermal entropy that grew uh, when L was going to infinity. And okay, the, uh, uh -huh, sorry, was there a question? Okay, I, I, not a question, I think. Uh, so because if we have some, so we have some competing settles, we have a naive, Settle where we don't have any island, and then we have this settle with the island, and we claim that for large enough interval, the settle with the island dominates. Okay, so I just want to stress that this island calculation, all the replica wormholes, they were packaged into this uh, island calculation. Okay, I'm already using the result of all this. So there are replica wormholes on top of the bracket wormhole. That's what produces uh, this uh, uh, finite answer for the entropy. Okay. All the discussion of replica wormholes was uh, squeezed into just this uh, generalized entropy formula, including the island. Victor? Yes? Uh, so did you expect that the entropy should saturate because the universe has a boundary? Uh, yeah, well, in some sense, yes. Um, let me... Let me explain, uh, maybe probably the last thing that I can explain today is that if we, if we did not saturate the entropy, there would be a paradox in the anal some analog of information paradox, okay? So that's why we knew that something would happen. Now, you could also, from, from some, if you could say that this state, you know, if you could go back to, uh, to this picture and say that the whole gravitational region is just, again, but again, rotated 90 degrees, right? 
that this state preparation is given by some quantum mechanical system that lives on this line. Then from some studying, you know, general properties of boundary states in CFTs, you could also conclude that entropy should saturate because uh, uh, it's hard to produce a state by some, you know, uh, local system that lives on the boundary, you don't really produce state with very long range entanglement. But it's not super robust, I would say. Uh, but uh, uh, yes, there, there, there were reasons to, exp uh, in a moment I'll explain why we had to have something like this. Okay, but it's-, it's Okay, so yeah. this is very different than computing, say the entropy like of an interval on the, say, the ground state of a CFT2 and then taking this interval to be very large. Yes, yes, this is, so it's different than uh, both of those. Yes, so if, so if, if we have the uh, S, let's say in the hartle hawking state, it would be like C over three log L over, epsilon uv okay that we get logarithmic growth also we see from this formula right if l is smaller than the temperature that is sort of set to one in this formula then we get logarithmic growth now naive entropy so this is the naive entropy on hartle hawking state okay uh, now uh, then there is a thermal answer which is linear in l instead we get something finite there is something Okay, maybe I can explain it now. Um, let's see what would happen. So we could say, okay, this bracket wormholes are crazy. Okay, uh, we, we could take this point of view. They, quantum mechanics prohibits us to consider bracket wormholes. Let's just consider hartle hawking state, uh, but still use uh, the, let's still use the, uh, the island formula, okay? And see where it takes us. Let's do this. And then I'll come back to what I wanted to say if I have time. Um, okay, so this is just what I just said. We say we exclude the bracket wormhole state. We just consider this state and we consider the entropy. But now this is just hartle hawking and another copy of hartle hawking right? So naive entropy grows logarithmically because CFT, you know, ADS space is conformally flat. CFT just lives in the vacuum. So there's just a vacuum entropy of this interval. But now we need to look for islands. Okay, so same rules, we're using same rules we do for black holes. We try to generate some uh, dynamical twist fields. And it turns out that now these twist fields, they end up being time-like, okay? Because remember, I, it's same calculation as in black hole case, but I, now this is my time, right? So I find these time-like islands. Uh, and again, when we take interval large enough, but now we need to take it exponentially large in entropy, uh, these islands will uh, dominate, okay? So it's the island configuration that gives the dominant contribution to the entropy. However, that, th that leads to a paradox, to some version of uh, AMPS paradox that uh, Yiming uh, uh, came up with. So basically we can uh, do something uh, slightly more complicated. We can consider two fields, okay? So we can get our original field. So we have uh, CFT C plus uh, CFT P, where P is like a probe CFT, so that uh, CP uh, is uh, much smaller uh, than C, say just some order one uh, number of fields, okay? And then, uh, well, I, I do not know it, it, to, to which extent of uh, detailization uh, you want to be taken from this, uh, but basically we can consider we can consider a calculation of different entropies. We can just consider entropy of a probe fields on our interval L. Uh, we can uh, consider uh, the you know total entropy of probe fields. So this AP A, A bar is the uh, complement of my uh, region. Uh, L, okay, it's, it's, it's here in purple. Uh, then we can consider entropy uh, in the interval L, but now both fields of probe fields and the uh, original fields. Uh, okay. Uh, and then uh, we can consider the union of the three. So the reason I, and oh, 
the, the point is that only two of these configurations will be dominated by islands. Okay, that is because uh, you see CFT peak has a small central charge. So uh, I can have this inequality holding when I include all my matter fields, uh, but I can still have the uh, inverse of this inequality holding uh, when I only have the, uh, let me just uh, write, write it separately. So I'm in, I, I'm in this regime, but nevertheless, I want to invert this inequality if I just consider the, uh, the prop fields, okay? I, I, can, I can choose this situation. And then in this situation, uh, these two entropies, they will be just given by the naive answer. On the other hand, uh, these two combinations, they will be given by the uh, island formula. And then out of these four objects, uh, I can form this uh, strong subadditivity inequality, okay? So this is for any systems, uh, for any um, quantum mechanical systems, uh, AC, uh, AP, and uh, A bar P, uh, this inequality, this object should be bigger than zero. Okay, this is what's called uh, strong subadditivity. Uh, strong subadditivity. So uh, this is some, you know, follows from general principle of quantum mechanics. It must be true. And the calculation is that it's not true. And moreover, it's not true by a large margin. Okay, what sits here, this log is large. This, this because of this inequality, uh, sorry, because of this inequality, if we make this inequality strong, uh, then, uh, uh, then, uh, then this logarithm uh, is very large and positive, and we violate strong subjectivity uh, by a large amount. So this is some sort of analog of uh, black hole information uh, paradox here, I would say. If we try to prepare the state just by hartle hawking okay, but we still use the island formula to calculate the entropies, we arrive at the paradox, okay? Uh, however, there is a, yeah, so then there is an interesting did I write it here? No, I didn't write it here. Uh, but um, uh, there is uh, an interesting consistency check that basically the, yeah, there was a condition of dominance of the bracket wormhole that is over here. And of course, our interval L uh, must always be shorter than L. So basically, every time the so this the following statement: the island, if I'll just draw pictures, right? If uh, this uh, dominates over the over this over the entropy calculation, uh, I need to take l little l large enough. Remember, I mean that was because I need I need these islands. To dominate over the naive entropy. So I need to take this uh, little l large enough, but uh, little l is uh, smaller than total l. So if this dominates over this, then necessarily this inequality holds. Okay, I mean, you can trust me on this. Like we checked it into, into several modifications of this model, it always works, okay, for all values of the parameters. It always works. So before you run into, and remember this, as I showed, uh, uh, runs us into the strong subadditivity paradox. So before you run into strong subadditivity paradox, uh, it's always the bracket wormhole uh, that starts to dominate. And we can also check that islands on the bracket wormhole uh, are always considered with, uh, are always consistent with strong subadditivity. So everything gets reconciled, but only if we allow ourselves to consider bracket wormhole. Uh, so uh, I had a very silly question. Uh, in the Lorentzian picture, we know that states are evolved unitarily, but uh, in the Euclidean setup, uh, states uh, decay to the ground state. Uh, so what does it mean that uh, the black hole uh, state is uh, having contribution from the semi-classical and bracket wormhole? 
if the states uh, are analogous to the Euclidean set. Um, uh, I'm not sure I fully understood the question. Uh, let's see. The question is uh, that at late times, all states decay to vacuum in the Euclidean picture. Oh, you uh, mean if I if I evolve for long enough in this yeah. yellow region, then my state gets projected to the vacuum. That was your yeah. question. Yes, yeah. you are right. Uh, you are right. Uh, this is why I get some interesting constraints. Uh, if this uh, uh, length, so that's what I was calling tau, right? Here. So uh, we usually take this tau uh, small or smallish, okay? So then we get interesting constraints. Uh, so moreover, most of the formulas that I showed to you, they were for tau equals zero. They become somewhat bulky for non-zero tau. Uh, but yes, we stop, if, if tau is large enough, then we stop getting some interesting information. Moreover, for tau large enough, uh, a wormhole bracket, wormhole uh, never dominates. Okay, so... Uh... It but but it you also do not run into strong subjectivity paradox. So this is when I said that we did some non-trivial check. This check involved that for any involved the calculation for any value of tau, uh, what I said before is true that for if you have tau such that you have construct a strong subjectivity paradox, then for this value of tau uh, and given lengths, you know, bracket wormhole uh, will dominate. But for large enough tau, bracket one falls never done. It. Uh, so it's, uh, I had similar doubts in the island setup. Uh, how do we quantify the dynamics in the Euclidean setup when everything is in the spatial coordinates? Uh, this might be a very silly question because uh, uh, I haven't understood it properly, but uh, since uh, states are not evolving dynamically with time, uh, because they are uh, uh, damned uh, by imaginary time. So uh, how do we really know that uh, states, uh, we do really get uh, bracket wormholes in the Euclidean setup? Things like this would have been fine if we were working in the Lorentzian setup because uh, their states are dynamical, but... Uh, uh, no, but here, okay, the, the idea here is that I'm preparing my state by a path integral that is uh, Euclidean. And okay, it in principle, it can go, uh, you know, it can go have some Lorentz and parts. It's okay, maybe I'll, I'm running out of time, but maybe I can, uh, in, in questions, I can review a little bit what happens in uh, in the Citrus space where this preparation is actually Lorentz and preparation, right? So cosmological preparation of this state will be Lorentz. But here, it, it's not so important. Here it's a Euclidean preparation but then at this red line, I can start evolving uh, what I wrote here, right? Uh, we can start evolving our state in Lorentz and signature. And we say that this theory, this is now just a CFT Hamiltonian and it should be a state in a CFT Hilbert space. There is no more gravity. It's a well-defined Hilbert space. And, you know, we can do unitary evolution uh, from uh, now on. Uh, beginning from this red line, it's sort of, you know, perpendicular in the sense that we go in the uh, imaginary direction. Uh, but we, if it is a state in the Hilbert space that we prepared, it must um, agree with uh, all the, uh, you know, all the axioms of quantum mechanics. So it is, it is an assumption. You may say nobody guaranteed us uh, that gravity prepares consistent quantum mechanical states. And the, the idea is that in, in idea CFT, we know this is true because, well, because just, you know, gravity is a rewriting of uh, CFT uh, way of preparing state of CFT evolution. There is tautological. There we know that there should be any paradox. Here, when uh, that's what I said, when we start thinking about cosmology, we don't have, you know, a robust analog of ADS CFT. So indeed, it could be that uh, you know gravity, I don't, does not prepare a 
we could imagine something like this. gravity does not, there's some violation of quantum mechanics in cosmology. Gravity does not prepare a sensible uh, quantum mechanical states. Okay, so, but the, what we learn from this uh, toy model at least that no, this gravitational path integral is clever enough uh, that when it runs into some problem with preparing a state, like the strong stability problem, it also has a way to fix it. Uh, which is self-consistent. The, the fixing comes before the paradox, right? So that's what I said. That is the logic here, that uh, we don't have that much certainty in cosmological setups what to expect. Uh, we rather just, uh, you know, do some, a little bit of guesswork. Uh, but then once we see some non-trivial consistencies coming out of this uh, guesswork, then uh, we become happy. Okay, so this is the philosophy. I do not know if that answers your question, but this is the philosophy, at least, that I have here. Uh, so can you comment about the time scales when bracket wormholes dominate over the Hawking hurdle saddles? Um, are you talking about this time scale tau? Uh, yeah. Or by time scale, you call what I call time scale, or you, or you call the, the size? Uh, yeah, so uh, in uh, the case of replica wormholes, we find page time to be some time scale after which we can quantify different things. So is there a sim there must be yeah, a so here, as I said, here it's more it's more important as a length scale. So let's work, let's imagine that this time tau, this time of Euclidean evolution, the yellow region is small. Uh, then this is the inequality that we have. We have, I can just rewrite it for you here. C squared L uh, has to be bigger than uh, two as zero phi B, right? So as zero and phi B, these are parameters of the model, right? You remember what phi B is, is a boundary value of the diloton. This is some large finite number. Uh, C is the central charge and this gives you a value of L. L is now the size, but that is what the that that that's what was the analog of like page time in a sense. But remember, it's it's a different effect that dominates here. It's not the um, it's not the replica wormhole that well, wormhole that come in. It's this bracket wormhole comes in. For replica wormholes, we get again we get something um, uh, similar uh, here, right? For replica wormholes, again there is a uh, on naive heart of Hawking saddle, right? There was this uh, uh, length scale L, which is the analog of the time scale in the black hole setup. And okay, something exponentially large in entropy. Uh, well, although we, as I said, with this number we sort of scale it as fixed, uh, but uh, but it's still something something large. So, so there are diff there are different time scales, right? So, okay, they all uh, uh, there is all length scale. There is this length scale. Uh, there is uh, uh, this. There is this length scale of dominance of the island on top of the bracket wormhole over the naive bracket wormhole entropy calculation, and then there is. Uh, where is this this length scale, which is the dominance of uh, uh, bracket wormhole over the heart of Hawking contribution to the trace of density matrix? So the, the, there is different length scales that are important. Um, it's they all related in one way to to analog of uh, sort of to entropy, right? To sort of analog of Gibbons Hawking entropy of this uh, space time, but. Uh, uh, they they all scale differently with say central charge of matter and with some other parameters of the model. So it's not I don't have like an immediate interpretation uh, of in individual phys I don't have an individual physical interpretation of these uh, uh, length scales other than the fact that they all organize their hierarchically in a way to avoid uh, you know certain problems in this model.
Okay, I uh, I do not know what yeah what is your policy regarding time. I I, uh, I in principle I said the most important things, so I can just uh, wrap up. Is that the right strategy? Yeah, I I think like how many minutes do you still need? Look, there is no upper limit. I mean, it's uh, <laughs> so I, I, let me let me tell you. Okay, so I think I just summarized what I said. Uh -huh. uh, let me just tell the two other things that exist. Okay, as we can call them future directions. Okay, no. uh, because they are not as robust. I'll just name them uh, so that you know that, that you know there is something mentioned about that in the paper and some work on it that's going on. Uh, that that's two minutes. I'll just I'll just say what what they are. No uh, so one thing is the uh, this setup that I had. There is this bracket wormhole, and on top of bracket wormhole, there is a replica wormhole that creates this island. So now, what is the entanglement wedge interpretation of this picture? Okay, so we can now consider this region on the boundary and. Uh, apply some you know some do some entanglement wedge reconstruction and the idea is that it will reconstruct uh, something inside this island i and the claim is that the the entanglement wedge reconstruction picture is uh, that um, uh, we have an emergent closed universe so this island evolved in Lorentzian signature produces uh, some FRW universe which with past and future singularities so in principle, by, by applying some sort of entanglement wedge reconstruction to our CFT state, we can, re we can reconstruct physics of some closed universe. This, is, this will be analogous to reconstruction of black hole interior, uh, other than the fact that there is no, like we don't need to wait till black hole evaporates or anything like this. Uh, it's, it's just a matter of analyzing the state at a given moment of time, but analyzing the state uh, precisely. Uh, and uh, okay, uh, another yeah, and then another thing maybe I want to say that there is also an analogous De Sitter model, so we can um, uh, start thinking about same picture, green space, oops, yellow, uh, yellow space, reheating surface. And consider again the same JT gravity here over here. Oops. Same uh, JT gravity here plus matter and allow matter to go through. Uh, but now we change the sign of the cosmological constant. We can consider the Sitter version of uh, JT gravity. And the punchline of this story is that if you just consider hartle hawking state, you also run into strong stability paradox. So you know that you need to have bracket wormhole. Uh, but we couldn't really construct an explicit bracket wormhole solution. There are some technical complications with finding explicit bracket wormhole solution. So there are some extra tricks you need to do to construct uh, the bracket wormholes. So, uh, and the same issue persists in higher dimensions. So we can also ask, okay, what's going on in higher dimensions? And in higher dimensions, um, uh, also it seems like there should be this bracket wormhole solutions, but uh, so far nobody constructed an, um, an explicit one. So, uh, so this is uh, uh, roughly speaking in the state of affairs. We have this, uh, uh, Euclidean ADS model that we understand pretty well and uh, that passes, you know, uh, comes along with this intuition that uh, non perturbative effects are important and, and they pass several consistency checks. And we have a, a feeling that similar things should work in actual cosmological states, you know, prepared by some De Sitter like evolution. Uh, but uh, we, we don't have like a robust. Uh, calculations so far. Neither we have proofs that they don't exist. I mean, it's, it's sort of hard to prove that something like this does not exist. But uh, uh, but this is this is where we stand. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll stop here.
Okay, thanks for the very nice talk. Uh, and um, we have uh, a lot of questions during the, the, the presentation. Maybe we'll take one or two more questions. Is that okay? That's fine with me. Uh, <laughs> I have another question, Victor. So yeah, thanks for the great talk. When you explain this paradox of strong subadditivity, could you go back to that slide? Yeah, so why are you drawing the branch cuts uh, vertically in this picture? I mean, you joined, you joined the twist fields of the upper boundary to the, to the twist fields below, but you could also join them by joining the two uh, green or black dots. I understand. Them. Yeah, let's let's go let's go through this a little bit slowly. So, is this, is this a result of the, the extremization procedure, or it's something? No, no. But you get you get the same answer, right? Yeah. Because uh, well, we have a twist field. So we have tau, and here we have a tau bar, and here. Uh, we generate a tau bar and here tau, right? So you're right that, okay, I drew cuts like this. We could have drawn cuts like this, but you get the same answer. It's just uh, because uh, size of this, it's more intuitive. I mean, if we draw, if we draw cuts like this, we get two large uh, numbers that cancel, right? Uh, because I, I take this, this is some L and this is some call it, uh, I don't know, A. And we're in the regime where L, there's some conformal factor, but because it's a CFT, we, you know, we take it into account and forget about it. So we're in the regime when L is, sorry, we're in the regime when L uh, is much bigger than A. Then it's, then this entropy is just, two times, uh, uh, you know, C over three log A, right? Because it factorizes. We're in the OPE limit, where it's, I can take OPE ah, of okay, this. Okay, 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 I see. But of course, we, we know, you know, in some free CFT, we know an exact answer for this four-point function, right? And then we can, uh, but yeah, doesn't matter how we compute it. There are some corrections coming from the fact that the finite distance, but yeah. Uh, it, it's more, it's, yeah, it's, you faster get to the answer if you draw cuts like this. That's it. Okay. Any more questions? Uh, so just one last question. Uh, so you mentioned about uh, the uh, twist uh, field positions and uh, there can be more than one twist field position. So uh, could he please uh, comment on that? Sorry, they can, the, uh, you're asking how I determined the twist field positions? Yeah, and why are there more than uh, one twist field positions? Well, uh, th there, are, there are two twist fields uh, because uh, I have uh, two original twist fields, right? So, and okay, I need like even number of them to uh, to have some consistent configuration because, I mean, I can send some of them to infinity in a sense, uh, but, uh, uh, but, but in reality, especially from a compact manifold, I need to have uh, uh, even number of them to just uh, uh, connect uh, the cuts uh, consistently. So now to determine the twist, again, we can, we can assume that the configuration that we find is in the OPE limit, uh, what I said in this, in this configuration. Again, we looked for, you know, for twist fields not in the OPE limit and okay, you, under some assumptions, you do not find anything. So now in this uh, position, we re our entropy factorizes into just, um, uh, okay, let me just create a new page here, I'll explain a little bit more detail. So basically, again, this is my, uh, these are my original twist fields. And I assume that I'm an OPE limit. So I'm saying that one uh, emergent twist field is somewhere here and one, you know, somewhere here. 
for example. So now, because I'm an OP limit, I can say, okay, I can just focus on, so S is just S1 plus S2. And S1 is just entropy of these guys. And S2 is the entropy of these guys, okay? So now I simplified my problem a little bit. So now what is S1? S1 uh, generalized, okay? It is S0 plus phi of, so say this has coordinates uh, uh, Z1 and chi1. Uh, and this say has coordinates 0, 0, just by choice of coordinates. Plus uh, phi of Z1, chi1, value of my diloton, right? Plus entropy of matter fields uh, on this region. Uh, this is what? Uh, this is C over three log of uh, distance between these two points, right? It's like uh, Z1 squared plus K1 squared, square root. And then there is also a scale factor, right? Uh, because there is, well, there is a UV cutoff and then the UV cutoff comes with a scale factor. Okay, because so it's a C. C try to do is to extremize this entropy and find the position of the twist field. Exactly, exactly. Now I take this equation, I extremize it with d by d chi one of this stuff is zero and d by d z one of this stuff is zero. And I find something like we can solve these equations, but uh, uh, I mean, uh, okay, become some, some quadratic or cubic equation, or maybe some transcendental equation if this is some trigonometric function in our case, but, uh, but okay, we can solve it, right? And then we find some position. But, it, but it's easy to see that uh, chi one is equal to zero, right? Because uh, everything here is, uh, you know, symmetric. So clearly you find an island uh, right under the point uh, in this uh, OPE limit. And then the, uh, the, the Z coordinate, which is, you know, Z, Z coordinate is coordinate goes into the bulk, okay? It's determined by this equation. Uh, so just uh, one more clarification. Phi, the value of phi only depends on Z1, no? It's independent of chi. Yeah, 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 yeah. In this setup, yes, you're right. I mean, I just writing general formula, but yes. Uh, thanks a lot, sir. It was a very useful talk for me, uh, understanding many doubts I had. Uh, okay. Just, uh, uh, okay, can the speaker allow me for uh, one last question, please? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. As long as uh, organizers allow, I, <laughs> I allow. Sure, go ahead. Uh, uh, could you comment something ab about the signature of state depend about uh, signature of state dependence of uh, the signature of state dependence in the states which you prepared? Uh, signature, you mean um, state dependence of uh, uh, some sort of bulk reconstruction? Uh, is, yeah. is that like you 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 referring to state dependence? in the sense of uh, some black hole interior reconstruction. Yeah, that... so you were preparing states uh, uh, B as semi-classical states plus uh, non-perturbative correction. So are there signatures of state dependence in these uh, kind of states? So uh, if we uh, allow the action of operators on these states, these operators act uh, differently on different states? Uh, as... Well, it's it's, Probably yes, in a sense you're referring to, but you see here the situation is a little bit um, different conceptually, yeah. because I really study a single state. Okay, uh, I, it's an assumption here uh, that there is some uh, kind of preferred state constructed by a smooth gravitational path integral. And the rules of the game that, uh, okay, we include uh, some smooth gravitational contributions that connect Brian and the cat. But it's only like, I, all my talk, I study single state. So it's not, uh, let me go back to here. I mean, it's sort of important conceptually. Um, um, so I wrote the formula. Sorry. Oh, 
very confusing. Disappear. Uh, this. Okay. I, let me write the formula again. I don't know where it went. So I study the state B of tau. Yeah, you and, wrote it above it. You wrote it just. Uh, above yeah. It. Okay. Yeah. Doesn't matter. Plus something else, but it's not. I do not know how to independently study say just this state, or it's not even clear in this formula what makes up the uh, bracket wormhole state. So probably, probably the picture is that this actual state there are some many many some uh, singular. States corresponding to some singularity in the bulk, in a way that when we compute the trace of, of a density matrix or some entropies, they resum into some smooth geometry. But it's important that to say here, I do not know how to study individually some, you know, one state coming out of here, or uh, one state, uh, or just the the heart of Hawking state, because it doesn't even make sense as a state. You know, if I try to can just force myself to write a gravitational pattern that creates this that doesn't make sense in a state so i i do not know how to uh, like check this state dependence because i really know how to analyze a single state in this yeah. picture so mm -hmm. it's it's a little bit extra to to what we did to uh to ask yeah, how would it, it look like in a different state so probably yes but like it's I do not know how to start doing it because uh, for for now our struggle is just with a single state to understand this single state, which is sort of complicated. Yeah, uh, thanks. I do, it's not it's not like because in the black hole case you, you we can consider different we can make black hole of different stuff right and this will be different microstates of the black hole, uh, or we can throw something into a black hole and change its state. Here we don't have this luxury. Like I do not know how to manipulate this state. I don't have like any initial state that I evolve. It's it. I just have some rules to prepare one state, and that's it. Yeah. Uh, th thanks a lot. Sir. Yeah. So let's thank uh, Victor again. Thanks for this very nice talk, and. Uh, in case anyone else would like to ask a question, maybe I could stop recording and uh, make you the uh, host, and then people can still ask questions. Or... Sure, yeah, yeah, I can, I can, yeah, I can stick around for a little bit. Okay, thank you.